I honestly wasn't holding up much hope for this episode, probably in large part due to the previous reminders that putting all the production gang back together that made the show successful back in the day hasn't exactly been a recipe for success so far. This episode stood as another glimmer of hope for redemption by putting Stephen Moffat back in the writing seat for this series' bottle episode. I always maintained the belief that he was better when he wasn't in the driver's seat working alongside Russell. This belief still holds firm today as this episode has been a bit of a shock to the system. The story had surprises, the dialogue had me laughing, and oddly, the Doctor felt like the Doctor. Having been submerged in Moffat-era episode reviews for so long, perhaps it is impossible for me to see the Doctor being written in any other way. Perhaps the goal of reviewing each and every episode critically has always been an attempt to reassure myself that no, I haven't just grown out of Doctor Who, it has actually declined in quality since 2010. Either that or I'm just riddled with nostalgia and I'm unable to move on. Speaking of goals, something I've been striving to do this year is learn more about DaVinci Resolve, the editing software that I'm currently using to edit these videos. It has taken some time to get used to, and I'm really thankful that I've been able to take a deep dive into the countless DaVinci Resolve tutorial classes and videos over on Skillshare. For one thing, this whole green screen thing needed a lot of figuring out, and I'm looking forward to mastering color grading and fusion over there as well. Skillshare is a huge online learning platform run by professionals, experts, and creatives. They've got classes on pretty much anything from painting to business management to interior design. It's kind of insane. Start a learning journey on Skillshare to enhance your skills. The first 500 people to click my link down in the description will get a whole month free trial of Skillshare. Without my link, you only get a week to try it out. A month's free trial gives you enough time to try Skillshare properly, with enough time to watch through a learning path and commit to learning how to do something properly. Become one of the first 500 people to join the largest learning community for creatives by clicking my link down in the description. Now, without further ado, Let's get on with the review. Boom begins with two soldiers trekking their way home. They only built one exterior set, which isn't exactly around beyond the title sequence. The rest of the episode takes place in this no man's land studio set, or in front of a real time screen. Not even the great sunset scene at the end of the episode gives me an inkling of wonder or awe. What made matters worse was the smoky ember laden air that was clearly just a visual effect. Effect. None of the characters cover their mouths or even cough once in this supposedly hostile burning environment, which took me right out of the immersion of the episode fairly early on. The attention to detail, right? Real gravel on the floor it makes it feel like you're here. You know, it doesn't feel synthetic. It feels real. It's not real. Look, I get it. Shooting on location is a goddamn pain. I just think a few shots of the characters outside on a night shoot would have avoided some of the problems that this opening creates. The lack of a natural environment was made more evident during the lead up to these soldiers' deaths. Carson, the first soldier to die, is the one who trips and falls into the pits with the landmine. They evidently forgot to get a shot of his foot slipping or something because I honestly thought the lad had been shot or something. Surely it would have made more sense for the blind soldier to have tripped and fallen, but obviously the story needed to introduce the sinister ambulances and their ruthless killing of defective soldiers. I was rather pleasantly surprised by the inclusion of some Hooniverse world building in this episode. The weapon manufacturer's villain guard were mentioned all the way back in The Doctor Dancers with Jack Harkness's Sonic Blaster. Additionally, there was the inclusion of the Anglican Marines, the army that was miserably represented in the episode A Good Man Goes to War. They never really amounted to much beyond some really unfunny character names, nor did I really understand what they were about. I actually really liked the costume alteration to these Anglican Marines in this episode. The ones in A Good Man Goes to War don't have the clerical collars uh, that these soldiers do. This made them stand out not only looking satirically funny, but such a small adjustment makes them appear unique. In Boom, it's understood that there's a hierarchy of divinity among the ranks, explored vaguely through characters Kanto and Mundo. 
Andy. Their romance is a little cheesy, but I liked that the story kicked off with a misdirection about the latter doing tattoos for other soldiers. Mundy is actually played by the actress who's going to play a companion in the next series of the show that they're currently filming. The way the characters can communicate to each other almost telepathically with a touch of their cheek was a nice touch too. See what I did there? The Doctor steps on a landmine, and this isn't the first time he's been in this situation. All the way back in the 70s, Tom Baker's Doctor stepped on a landmine on Scarrow in Genesis of the Daleks. His companion, Harry, cut him out of that fix by, um putting some rocks under it, with none other than Sarah Jane Smith chirping in. Wedge something under it, make it firm. They managed to get the Doctor out of this fix in under two minutes, but this episode insists on the Doctor being fixed in place for nearly the entire episode, which is a fantastic idea. By removing the Doctor's ability to run, we can slow down to contemplate, reflect, and get our zen on. I really liked the everywhere becomes a beach someday line. Initially it's a shrug off excuse for why the Doctor never seems to take their companions anywhere nice, but it's also a statement of the Doctor's fourth dimensional perspective. The erosion of land by water is an inevitability, and inevitabilities are something a Time Lord would see far clearer than mortal non-time traveling characters. The Doctor then goes off on a tangent to explain how familiar he is with this type of bomb. V for Villengard. Biggest weapons manufacturer in recorded history supplied all sides in all conflicts for the past two centuries. Hmm. Sounds awfully like a certain country that reaps benefit from modern warfare in 2024. I, I wonder which one that could be. Oh yeah, it's the UK. The fact this episode came out in the midst of both the Israel-Hamas war and the Russian invasion of Ukraine, two conflicts the UK has arms supply interest in, they really couldn't have timed this episode's release better. Medical services optimize the casualty rate for continued conflict. War is business, and business is booming. This idea that ambulance bots are killing people who can't fight just to increase casualty numbers and get more munitions is quite frightening. The ambulances are produced and sent in by the Villain Guard Corporation as well, which creates this vicious cycle where the profits from weapons and mine sales are endless. The Doctor thinking out loud was terrific as well. All his talk of counterbalancing the weight so he can put his foot down created some great tension. Okay, it's exactly 6.732217 kilograms. I was trying not to show off. Even how he was able to calculate the weight of this human kimchi blender cup showed some mental calculating abilities instead of magic tricks. With the Doctor rooted to the spot, his lack of power and Ruby's insistence on helping him adds a layer of chaos into the mix. Unlike the previously mentioned scene in Genesis of the Daleks, it actually feels like Ruby not knowing what she's doing could have consequences. Now obviously we know that the Doctor won't be dying in this episode, but it's the tension of the Doctor being physically unable to control the situation that makes it the most interesting to me. The only thing he attempts to control is his blood pressure, which I thought was a terrific display of self-control on the character's part. That was really interesting to me. To see what those around him will do was something I didn't know I wanted. Suddenly, I started to truly feel the sacrifice Ruby was about to make when she was all calm and smiley to get the Doctor's blood pressure down, the pair singing a song about soldiers fighting, the Doctor rambling on to distract himself from the pair potentially dying together. It's written and performed really well. For those brief moments when the pair are like a hair length apart from each other, I could genuinely suspend my disbelief towards their lack of chemistry. The score's discordant piano tones were great as well. I couldn't believe I was appreciating the drama as much as I was at that point. Ruby seeing the alien planet in the sky was a bit of a weird moment though. Oh Ruby, I'm sorry, I forgot. Your first time on a new planet. It flips his stomach, doesn't it? It's not like she hasn't already had the big view of a planet already. Also, now I'm really confused. I assumed the pair had spent six months traveling based on this line. So when is it for you back home? What time are you? June 2024. It's hard to keep track, but yeah, I think so. June, July. But maybe they just had a six month break between Christmas and then? If not, did they genuinely spend the rest of their time together on Earth 
after space babies? Anyway, after the doctor could finally put his foot down, the other characters in the story start to enter the pit. I was humanely terminated on the discovery of the fatal condition, blindness. Blindness isn't fatal. You literally just said that to a dead blind guy. I genuinely burst out laughing over these lines, and then the dead soldier's kid shows up. Her name is Splice. It's a really stupid name. I really wasn't swayed by the child actor's wooden performance, but somehow this actually ended up working well for the story. When the ambulance was invading the space with its murderous desires, the sight of an insane little girl deciding to sit down and look at her dad's Facebook page whilst the world was burning around her I wouldn't put it past a grieving teenager in 2024 to be doing this. I was a little confused. Oh, I need some water. Suck it. I also really enjoyed the tension that was created as a result of the doctor holding the remains of her father to prevent the mine from going off. I was a little confused when the girl started to blurt out exposition about why she was in this war zone. It was still interesting to hear her express her religious fervor, almost as though her commitment to God would make her a willing pawn in this conflict. Even in the epilogue of the episode, her lack of emotion towards her father's death is a demonstration of her faith. Plus she has the AI version of her dad to keep her company. It's, it's a strange world approaching us if AI gets this smart. The girl's lack of recognition towards both what the doctor is holding and what's beneath his foot clearly shows this child has been kept in the dark about what sorts of danger are beyond the reach of the camp. That then got me thinking though, isn't it rather convenient that the child reached the crater without stepping on an invisible mine herself? Or managing to leave the camp without an adult going with her or even stopping her from leaving? At least Mundy went out looking for her and this was when another cracker of a joke came our way. Great name, Mundy Flynn. You should marry Ruby. Then you'll be Monday, Sunday. Mundy then spoke to her love interest character, showing unwavering concern towards the previously mentioned tattoo. Unfortunately, her blurting out the answers to the doctor's questions doesn't really make a lot of sense. Okay, this idiot little war, who are you fighting? The Castarians. No, 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 no. The, the correct answer is- Who are you fighting? Don't you know? How can you be on this planet and not know about the conflict that you are literally standing in the middle of? Thankfully this blip doesn't last for very long because Mundy insists on the doctor dropping the human remains. Just let it fall. No, if he drops the casket, it'll trigger the landmine. It will kill him. He's dead already. Reflecting the life is cheap mentality of the corporation that the Anglican Marines are buying from. Ruby somehow manages to grab the gun from Mundy and everything escalates so fast from there. I I was not expecting Kanto to come along and shoot Ruby. Like, that was goddamn excellent. It was a great twist considering appearances made it out like Mundy was surrendering to Ruby. The rolling down into the pit slow motion stuff looked excellent too. I quite liked the trundling little ambulance design and the fact that it has the face of Susan Twist, who has appeared in nearly every new episode since 2023, had me wondering if she will wind up being a character in the long run. If it's just for the sake of having a recurring cameo though, or like a Russell T Davies misdirection, that will suck. The ambulance asking about next of kin prompts the mandatory snowing sequence. The only way that Ruby would be revived would be if she was ordained. This was where I thought we would get a spontaneous ordination ritual from one of the Marines, but alas, I guess I was hoping for too much. I ran the numbers, you're right. You're gonna blow a really big hole in everything. You could wipe out every Anglican here. With the revelation that the whole planet is going to be blown apart if the mine goes off in a matter of minutes, maybe a higher authority might need to be brought in? Maybe an evacuation would need to be ordered? No. Neither Mundy or Castro communicate to anybody at the base about the impending destruction. Instead, deciding to help somebody they've only just met, knowing that they themselves only have five minutes to live. So the Doctor decides to explain to the Marines that they weren't fighting anything to begin with. I think the reasoning for why the Marines were here in the first place could have been fleshed out a little more, but then I think about how most soldiers on the front lines naturally get the feeling that they're fighting without Without truly knowing the reason why. I mean, most armies would notice that they were fighting smoke and shadows, but not this lot, because they have faith. Shut up! Faith! The magic word that keeps you never having to think for yourself. That line sent 
Serious shivers down my spine, man. What a delivery. What a great set of lines. Shut up and Google. This is the first time I can say that Shuti Gatwa has absolutely killed it this series. The Doctor asks for the impossible from the AI hologram of the dead blind soldier, and I loved how he tested it for an emotional range. Knowing that the AI is trying to replicate the dad to the best of its abilities, it would surely want to know that somewhere deep down, a good father is something that it can be. I mean, it had to in order for it to save the day, right? I loved seeing Mundy's internal conflict with her faith. So she can conceive of a higher being that she has never seen before, but has no faith in an AI being able to make a decision based on fatherly emotions. It's a great contrast. Simultaneously, she begins to lose her faith in the face of cold, hard facts, draining every drop of hope from her soul God almighty, this is the kind of character I want to see in an episode of Doctor Who. Unfortunately, the cheesy romance seeped into the story once again, with a strange off-screen death that occurs with Kanto. He was messing around with the ambulance to try and get it to revive Ruby, which in turn killed him for the attempted meddling? How exactly the ambulance kills Kanto is never properly shown, so you can imagine how confused I was when his hologram is shown coming out of the ambulance. Had the ambulance opened itself up like a Venus flytrap or even a Dalek sec, maybe we could have had a really frightful death here. Instead, the doctor has to spell it all out for us. The ambulance killed him. Before a whole bunch of other ambulances show up, repeating the thoughts and prayers mantra. I really liked that, that being their catchphrase. Like, it just exemplifies a real life corporate lack of compassion for when many lives are lost. Just as the AI comes back to distract his child again. Until we saw, until we saw the antelope together. I, I remember, I remember daddy. I literally forgot she was there the whole time. <laughs> I really need to stop using children in this show. I'm guessing that the AI generated from the dead blind soldier somehow turned itself into a virus and magically infiltrated the mine and all of Villengard's ambulances. The whole Villengard arms <coughs> industry, all of it, <coughs> just got beaten up by this little kid stand. What? <coughs> Langard mainframe has been taken down by parent power. <laughs> <coughs> that's real weak, man. Like, that's weak. That's some weak bud. I thought the AI's task was to find proof that the Castarians don't exist, firstly, and also that the Anglican Marines were dying to the music musicians, munitions that they were buying. Then that proof would be brought to the bishop so that he could make peace, surrender, whatever, in the hope that this would diffuse the mind. Convoluted as that may sound, I thought that was the plan. I really think the episode needed an additional character, or at least make one of the named characters a bishop. Because this virus outbreak thing that gets squashed and then unsquashed had me super confused. So the characters look at that phony ass sunset and then we are confronted with a positive element of faith, the acceptance of death. Even the doctor has to fess up that it's better than having a wailing red-faced child around for company. Sorry, I'll rush off like this, but he probably needs changing. I'll get the baby wipes. Space babies. Christ, maybe I am too old for this show. No lingering, plenty more universe to see, and quite frankly, your lifespan sucks. I love that kind of blunt force dialogue from him, especially after her nearly dying, which she seems uh, fairly nonchalant about. So, did it suck? I mean, this was an improvement, but it's still lacking a bit. I enjoyed this episode. I, I was really hooked by the Doctor's entrapment. The story incorporated elements to make it feel like it was a part of the Hooniverse, as well as tackling modern world issues like wartime profiteering. The exploration of faith was also really interesting, but that came with some very pungent cheese and a child whose intention in the story felt very muddled. The production issues leave uncomfortable sensations on the eyes and the wrap up of the episode definitely wasn't something I was overly keen on either. I give Boom a 7 out of 10. Decent enough, 7 out of 10.